and we will get started. Um, thank you guys all for coming. It's still too loud or too, too pitch? It's okay. <laughs> Try that, Kelsey. Okay, is that a little, it feels better. Okay, so welcome, you guys, this is amazing. I honestly thought my parents and my in-laws were gonna show up. <laughs> so, it's great to see actually people who are interested in coming out, and we normally have our events at Eisenbrow, so we thought we would try this out because we wanted the Prairie Talk to be with the Prairie behind us. Um, so we're welcoming Father Kevin here, so he can tell us about his experience with his prairie and the history of prairies. Um, we have a couple of things, just housekeeping to let you know. Um, my uncle Tom is right there. He's a master naturalist, so he has information up here. If you guys have any questions or interest in any resources after the talk, you can check that out. We have a table there. Um, where Marsh is at and Kristen are at. Uh, we have some free items you can grab if you'd like, and then a book that one of our board members, Tom Vanasek, wrote called Letters from Home, or Letters to Home. We have other buddies here. They are a local ice cream company. They purchase the milk from local farmers and make their vanilla ice cream. And um, Austin, my husband, there, he would like to take anybody who wants to go out on a, on, a, on a ride through the prairie afterwards, you guys can do that if you would like. So, and if you want, you can, if it's not too wet, you're welcome to walk through the prairie as well. All right, so we'll let Father Kevin go ahead and give his talk, and I hope you enjoy it. Curiosity or a question? Why don't you share it to you so I can 
maybe work it in, try to make up something during the talk. Well, it's a prairie and patience. I'd like to hear about that. Yes. Okay. I have a lot to say about that. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Everything else that you see? Yes. <laughs> is, is, is there, what's the benefit? Like, for prairie? Sure, yeah. I think we'll be covering a lot of that, I think. But, uh, as you, well, I won't even start answering that question yet. Anything else? Yes? mistakes. I have 30 years to tell you about that. Yes. There are shortcuts and there are long cuts. Don't take the long cuts. Okay? But uh, there are some rather simple things to you know to establish. Okay, anything else? Okay. This is my rendition of Minnesota. And I'd like you to know that half of Minnesota was a tall grass prairie before our European ancestors came. Are anybody, does anybody here have Native American background? Anybody here? Okay. Because if you are, I'm not going to say, say our ancestors. Okay. But if you would draw a line, something like this. Everything south and west of this line, tall grass prairie. Everything here, woods. What's going on? In nature, there's a war going on between forests and grass. The grass wins the war by burning the seedlings of the trees. The trees are in the war because grass needs sun and it shades the grass and it doesn't grow very well. The other thing I can say, it has to do with climate. That where there is a a fairly stable amount of rain over hundreds of years. Trees do pretty well. But when you have areas where there isn't much regularity to the weather and there's long periods of drought, trees don't do very well. A prairie handles a dry period quite well. Trees don't do well, unless your, your trees are cactus. But that explains a lot of why in the western part of the United States there aren't any, or very many trees. Maybe up in the mountains where they get snow and some amount of rain. But it also says something about up here. Because up here we have a lot of lakes, pictures came down, and so, but for the most part, everything south and west of that line, Progress Perk. The pioneers, when they came here from Europe, they would refer to this area as a sea of grass. And, you know, in, in southern Minnesota, there's some rolling hills and the wind had come and be bending the grass. The grass is up like this. And it looked like the ocean that they had just traveled across to get here. And you had to be very careful because if you off in the distance saw smoke and the wind was blowing this way, you had better start a fire right here and burn an area where you can take your wagon and your livestock and your family and get in that black area because you could not outrun the, the, the prairie fire coming at you. 
day a prairie fire is very, very hot. I had a, a, a woman observing the burning of my prairie, and the, the, the fire was probably from here to the cars out there. And she had her cell phone up like this, and she was doing this, because she couldn't look at the, the, the fire. The radiant heat was so much of it. So she would do it like this and recording the fire. And the cell phone closed down. The cell phone said, I'm overheating and I'm shutting down. Okay? The cell phone sometimes had more sense than we do. So, but that's interesting. So many of you have seen marsh fires. But a prairie fire is a, a, another category. Because once the wind gets a hold of it, and is pushing that heat into the grass ahead of it. The grass literally vaporizes, and it can be very exploded, and the flames can go up 10 feet in the air, and popping and cracking, and after it's done burning, it's like this floor. There's nothing there except carbon and dirt. It's gone. So, the, 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 the pioneers would say that you have two choices. One, you can dig a hole if you didn't get through the sod, cover yourself up with dirt, fire go over you. If you don't make it, that's your grave. <laughs> or you, you burn and you go to the area where it's for some safety. So, very different world. In Minnesota, there was all sorts of glaciers. And in some places, the glacier was two miles up. Can you imagine that? That much ice and snow, that much weight. And the thing is moving very slowly. But when, during that glacier period, the seas were way down. Most of the water that was in the, in the oceans was in the glaciers. And you know, you go around here and you see those rocks in the field. Those were the ball bearings underneath the, the glacier. Some of those things are really big. And they're fairly smooth and round. Well, they got round because the glacier was moving them along. And, and here in Minnesota, we have all of these lakes. Lakes are big blocks of ice that were the last to melt. So everything else melted. Then this big block was there and sunk down into the moist soil. And then you get 10,000 lakes. You go out into this area of Minnesota, and out there, very flat. Why? That's where Lake Agassi was. This huge lake created by the melting of the glacier. And Minnesota River Valley, what was that made? Well, all of that water had to get south some way. It dug out all that huge gap there that Mankato was in, and St. Peter's in, and all of that gap. Can you imagine all of that water, hundreds of thousands of years of water, finally cutting through and creating Mississippi? So, the prairies are all part of this. When Lake Agassi went away, this flat area here became a prairie. And one of the things we might say is that prairies change things. It takes a prairie, I was told, 500 years to make one inch of topsoil. You go out here in Minnesota and you start digging down, think about seven or eight feet of topsoil. If you go around here with our rolling hills, you see the top of the hill in the farm field is kind of yellow. And down here it's real dark. The topsoil was up here after we plow a field for years, the topsoil ends up down here. So when the pioneers first came, and John Deere created the steel bottom plow and all steel or iron, the prairie got killed. Because no one could go into that, that turf with a wood bottom plow or a shovel. I have, uh, we're constructing a hermitage and 
the lithium batteries are like 100 page, and you have to dig a trench down to the solar panels. And I had to, I don't know what it was, to break into 30 year old sod. Oh gosh, I'm, I'm so glad I'm not a dead steel. But we, we got it, got it in. But it is, it is really amazing the, the environment. So, uh, I'm not kind of jumping all over the place. So, our ancestors came, and they came from Europe. And in, in my Czech background, and certainly in the Irish background, uh, there was smaller and smaller farms. The population had grown. They couldn't divide up the farm anymore. The land was depleted. Uh, it was hard to grow things. Many, I mean, if you were Irish, there was this famine going on, and so you either died in the ditch of starvation or you came. So millions of people came. Many of our ancestors came because they really had to. And they came here, and they became landowners, either through uh, the Homestead Act, which was in the 1860s, or my great-grandfather. And my great grandfather was John Quirk. And in 1856, he purchased the land that I grew up on uh, between, between uh, Lake Washington and Lake Jefferson. And it was wilderness. And he purchased it there because the road from Dubuque to St. Peter, which was the only road, was right next to our farm. It would be our farm. So he purchased it, and in 1856, he and Margaret Smith were, uh, were married in Mankato, and they come out, and 13 children later, my grandmother was there. And so John Quirk was deliberate, but it wasn't stupid. Just because you can't read it doesn't mean that you don't know anything. He was a very industrious, sharp guy who made things happen. And his daughter read the newspaper too here. And so John, I have a lot of respect for John work and the hard work that he did in taking 300 acres, turning some of that acreage into uh, uh, fields that you could grow things. My hunch is there was a lot of chopping wood chopping trees now. There might have been some prairie, but the prairie boundary for this area probably is more along the lesion and, and everything south and west of the lesion. So that was the open area. And between the lesion and the end, or just a little bit more, you had what's called an oak savanna. And that was burr oak, which had thicker bark, and it could handle the prairie fire a little better than the other trees. But then, so John Kirk gets there and turns and breaks the ground, breaks the sod, and plants corn and wheat, and it takes off. It didn't need fertilizer. For thousands of years, this soil had been set up to grow grass. And, and there was a, a good amount of topsoil. So as soon as you broke that sod, and when you broke sod, you killed prairie bat plants because you cut off their heads. And that he saw an immense yields of corn and oats and wheat. And the barn that went up years later was probably, I don't know, probably oak beams that were eight inches across and 12 inches high. And not, you know, all of this. My gosh, that world was hard. And, and so the pioneers were very, very hard. And then in 1994, I, uh, I took 70 acres of the farm field and put it into rim, reinvest in the soil, and planted a tall grass prairie and 700 trees in the corner. So this is kind of, here are the trees, here are the corner, and then this, this was a low area, and I had a big backhoe come in, and a bulldozer, and I said, I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but you 
could just make a nice pond with some islands. And so they did. And all of this here, I planted in tall grass prairie. How do you do that? I was told to get a brilliant cedar and you put some forbs in it, which are flowers. And prairie grass is like feathers. It's very strange stuff. And you need a special cedar to get those fluffy things down into the ground. You plant it and don't plan on seeing a prairie for three years. And you keep it between 6 and 12 inches for the first two years. Why? Because prairie plants first set their roots. And they're little. Non-prairie plants, they set their roots as soon as the frost is on the ground. They're up and at them. And, they're, and they out-compete the small prairie plants. And they shape them. And your prairie doesn't take off. But if you cut off their heads, like I like to cut off the heads of quack grass and foxtail and other things, then you give your prairie a chance, the prairie seed, to assert itself and establish itself. That's what happened. And I, I really had, you know, the first two years of this 25 acres of tallgrass prairie, I was a church. Anything was coming. And I was fighting Canadian thistles and other aggressive weeds that are familiar to most of us here. After 30 years, there isn't any Canadian business. They can't out compete the established program. So that's something about management. Yes, do I do spot spray? Yes. And I would recommend Stinger. And a backpack sprayer with a handle of pump to go after the colonies of Canadian thistles because that's one of the advantages of Canadian thistles. They grow in colonies, and you spray two thirds of them with stinger, you get the whole works. And you come back after uh, a week and you spray the, the mint ones into this, then, then you don't see them. They are gone. Um, Let me say something about geology. This is, this is interesting, to me anyway. There's, Earth is 4.5 billion years old. When in that, that's 4,500 million years, it's a long time, okay? When the first forms of life came, I'm not sure, do you know, Kathy, what is it, a billion years ago? Two billion years ago? I'm not sure of the timeline. The early atmosphere of the Earth had very little oxygen. If you and I were back there, say two billion years ago, we would suffocate. There wasn't any oxygen. What there was was carbon dioxide. A lot of carbon dioxide. And there wasn't any coal in the ground. There wasn't any oil. There wasn't any natural gas. That wasn't in the ground. Why? Because plants, it plants, vegetation or photosynthesis is what makes coal and natural gas and oil. How? It's called photosynthesis. So the first forms of life on planet Earth were plants. And they had all of the oxygen, all of the carbon dioxide they could want to thrive, huh? Why? What do plants do? Like, look at that tree, or look at that grass up there. It's mostly carbon. Where did the carbon come from? That made that grass up there. The 
can come from the ground. If you look at a tree, a tree is way up there. If it comes from the ground, shouldn't it be concave? Where all of the carbon came from the ground and went up into the tree? That's what I thought for a moment. The carbon comes from the air. The plant says, oh, I, I need to build my body. So it takes the carbon off of the carbon dioxide and makes some wood. And then what happens to the oxygen? It goes all into the air. Isn't that convenient for us? Mammals and, and uh, oxygen using life did not exist. Plants started it out. And so what, what's, what is the coal? It's the bodies of the plant. It's called the sequestering of carbon, taking carbon out of the air and the carbon dioxide and putting it in the body of a plant or putting it in the ground. And over a, hundreds of thousands of years, it turns into coal and oil and natural gas. I don't know how all of that works, but that's what we have called. So what's going on now? What's going on now is this process of sequestering carbon, making coal and natural gas and oil. It took millions of years. It's a very slow process. In the last, what is it? How old is the industrial age? 150 years? What's happening? Something that took millions of years is getting reversed, and the carbon is going back into the air, carbon dioxide, which is global warming, etc. So we're, we're, we recognize that we are changing the greenhouse we live in. And so, again, that's something that the prairies can teach you. And so, uh, that's a little bit about, uh, so I, I look out at my prairie and I say, thank you for the breath I'm taking right now. <laughs> TPE is uh, the, the prairie enthusiast. And I will come to TPE. Some, a lot of these people know so much more about prairies than I do, but uh, we have a lot of fun. And I was at one of the annual meetings, and we were we had it at a college, and the college student was waiting on the table, and comes over to my uh, my table and said, "Who are you, people?" <laughs> and someone at the table said, "Well, we are people that are really interested in." and we're not quite sure we're crazy or not, but we gather together just to verify that we're not completely crazy. <laughs> so that was, it, it is, prairies, once you uh, get interested in it, can really be uh, a fun thing. I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship between forests and prairies. In a woods, two-thirds of the carbon that makes up the tree is above ground. The other, did I say two-thirds? I meant to say 50%. 50% is above ground. 50% of the tree is below ground. So, a lot of people will say, well, we need to take some of the carbon dioxide out of there and put it back into the ground. That's plant trees. And, and that's a good thing. In a prairie, 70% of the carbon that makes up the plant is below ground. 30% is above ground. And what's interesting is that each here, underground, 30% of that wood system dies. And then in the 
spring, it regrows and it sets new roots. So prairies are very efficient in utilizing carbon dioxide in the air to grow their grow the prairie. And one of the interesting things we were talking about, the heat of a prairie fire being something that is kind of off the charts. I, one time I had a fire department had to come when I was just starting this thing and that was not a nice good thing. <laughs>
holds on to its soil. And I asked uh, one of the prairie uh, uh, people who came and toured my prairie, he's the one that knows all the Latin names of the prairie plants. I said, uh, my prairie is 30 years old. How long will it take before it, before it looks like an original prairie? Because there's not many original prairies left. He says 300 years. <laughs> so, okay. Maybe my ashes can be distributed on the parents. Um, but it, it says something to me about uh, uh, the legacy that our European ancestors received from the natural world. It was extraordinary. Let me say something about the difference between Europeans, immigrants, and the native peoples. The native people were uh, hunters and gatherers. Some of them grew some, it's not what we would call agriculture. But for the most part, they moved around and they were very close to the earth. Their children and their, their own names came from the animals that were their brothers and sisters. That's how close they were. And so when the Europeans came and they started plowing the prairie, their experience of that was these people don't know what they're doing. They're wounding the earth. This is, this is a violent act on the earth. You know, and the uh, dust bowl here in the United States, and so much of the prairie in these rather dry areas was plowed. And then a drought came, and then you, instead of snow drifting, you have soil drifting. So, uh, the native people have a lot of connections to, to the, the natural world, and they have much to teach us about. And more and more, people are beginning to appreciate what that culture has to offer us. And it was a pretty destructive thing to that culture for us immigrants and our ancestors to come here. I won't need to get into that. But uh, there is some um, real good things that all of us can learn from the native culture. I'm going to stop right here and open the floor. I have talked for half an hour. Um, and see if there's any observations or thoughts or some additions or corrections.
the sea. You take like a mason's torch and you burn them. And I've had patches of waked out doing that because it has all that energy into the sea. And if you hit it at the right time, it's expelled the maximum energy. And by burning that, so you burn it right down to the ground. Take that torch and burn it, and I whole patches I pulled off doing that. Really? But it's See, got to, it's got to be timing. The conditions got to be right. Some yes. Some years it will kill it, and other years it won't. Yeah, stinger you spray when the thistles are budding, you know, and that's when when there's a lot of energy going into the plant, and uh, it gets the herbicide in it, takes it down into the roots, and goes into crisis. Um, I know with uh, sumac, if you cut the sumac after it leaves out kind of fully in the spring, it'll start up again, and then you cut it when it leaves out again, you cut it two times, and it won't store enough energy to survive the winter. And the sumac will go away. So there. Other comments? and spray bottles and cut to come off. I and three college students for two summers went into the woods to go after buckthorn and by the end of the summer one of the letters of buckthorn had changed. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> How often do you replenish new seeds and uh, replant your prayers? seeded once in the 30 years, you never had to go back in and re replant. In the early years, um, we had an infestation of weeds and the DNR thought that we needed to do uh, a killing of all the broadleaf plants in the prairie. So they went and did a massive spray of herbicide and all my flowers came you know, because the, the forms of the flowers, you know, and they're very sensitive to herbicide. So we did do what we call is an interseed, where you burn the prairie and then you go out there with the planter and you plant, you either throw it on the ground, which is the way nature does it, or you plant some seed. And, and that the flowers started up again, so I, I got them back in. I also found that uh, I mow this fire grate, and I was just telling someone, which is a wide fire grate. It's maybe as wide as this building. And uh, I'm finding that the flowers are proliferating where I've mowed the fire grate. Because I mow the fire grate, it takes the flowers that have, I have seed heads on them, chops them all up and scatters the seed all over the place. And the whole perimeter around the prairie, because I, I rake that and then I, I burn that, but the whole perimeter is loaded with flowers this spring. So the prairie pretty well takes care of itself. And if you don't burn, you're probably hurting your flowers more than you are your grass, because the grass is pretty aggressive and big books. Some people don't like big books because it crowds out on things. But hey, I've got a, some different terrain there on, on top of those hills where there's largely clay and the, this topsoil is down in the lower area. I have a lot of silos grama growing there, little short prairie grass, and certain types of forbs grow there as opposed to over here. You know? Yes. We have a lot of milkweed in Encourage it, but we also get absolutely infested with aphids because on our milkweed, just on the milkweed. Really? We're absolutely infested. Every one of them. You need some Asian beetles. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll get infested with Asian beetles. <laughs> I mean, that's why Asian beetles came over, you oh, know, really? is that, that they were, they went after, to go after yeah. the aphids. And the when, when the soybean fields get combined by my conservation shed, yeah. they all come over into the shed. And then I got motion detectors over in the corner, and I have to.
to shut off certain songs because the motion detector thinks there's an elephant in the shed and the beetle is crawling across the motion. <laughs> Of the things that I said, and Tom, do you have anything to add here, Tom, about what I said? Or? Well, I'm mean, just impressed with all the experience and, and interest in the room here for, for one thing. That's right. Um, it's deep. It is, right. and, and to tell you the truth, I don't, someone told me about cutting it two times and it'll go away. But I do what you do, is I have a, the herbicide is in a blue spray thing, you know. It, it, it's, there's a blue dye in it, so I know that I've sprayed that stuff, you know, I come off and I've sprayed stuff, it's gone. So that's true. Can you use that dye in any spray? So long as the dye is... So long as the spray is uh, uh, oil-based, you know, some sprays are water-based, mm -hmm. some sprays are oil-based, and I have it's it's a blue oil. Is this bark oil blue? Bark oil. Yeah, bark oil blue is brand name. Yeah, bark oil blue, and I two thirds of the mixture is that bark oil mm -hmm. blue, and then one third is herbicide, and I put it in a little spray bag. So, I mean, if you don't do that, it re-sprouts. And with buckthorn, you cut it off at the ground, and then the next summer you have to wash this high. Okay. Other comments? <clears throat> yes.
what is it? That they so I don't want a conservation district when we serve that. All right. They sell these plants. Lots of turkeys, 
pheasants, yeah. deer, it's a lot of deer beds in the, in the grass. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe it doesn't have a lot to do with the prairie, but it seems like a lot more like waterfowl. I, just, I grew up just back, I don't know, most of you can maybe see the house I grew up in. Um, we didn't see a lot of variety of ducks, and now we see On my, in the center of my prairie is a large pond, and I've had probably, oh, maybe 15 Canadian geese swimming around in there. Two swans came there, and I thought, oh, how wonderful swans and Canadian geese. I had the next week, no Canadian geese. Why? Swans don't like Canadian geese. <laughs> They will go after the nests and the, the little Canadian gates and the eggs. It's a it's a form of white supremacy. <laughs>